All right. Um, thank you very much, Hanlock. Um, I'm very happy to see many familiar faces here, and I'm very sad that we can't all go out for sushi and uh, and beer afterwards. But let's hope next year. Um, so yes, so this is uh, this is a joint talk with my uh, wonderful student Alan, and uh, the work is also uh, co-authored by. Um, uh, uh, Andrew Owens, uh, who is now a professor in Michigan. Um, so, uh, the program is going to be as follows. Uh, act one is going to be a long lyrical introduction by me, waving my old man cane. And then in act two, Alan will actually present the nitty gritty. Okay, so, th so, so that you know, you know, it's going to, it's going to have a, a definitely, you know, two different, two different, uh, 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 parts. So let's start from the beginning. You know, I haven't done. I have. I have started my work in video. My my. You know, uh, my last PhD paper was on video, and then I haven't touched it in 15 years. So this is a little bit of like stepping back and think. You know, why do we even need video? What's wrong with images? Why not just have images? Okay. Well, I can think of of a, a few reasons. First is of course that video gives us a richer signal. With a still, you look at it, and you know this could be a, a, a you know a, a person here or a couple of people, or it just could be like a splotch of paint on a canvas. And indeed, on the left example is indeed a splotch of paint on canvas from the master of the genre, Jackson Pollock. But as soon as you add video, it became becomes immediately obvious that this the, the one on the right is a person, right? So video does provide us with this extra extra information, extra boost. Um, second thing that I think is maybe even more important is video can teach us about correspondence. Um, and here I will use the say uh, the the quote I always try to use by Jorge Luis Borges. Um, it, it's from a, a short story, Fume the Memorias. Um, and he says, it irritated him that the dog at 3.14 in the afternoon seen in profile should be indicated by the same noun as dog at 3.15 seen frontally. Okay, so this idea that these two dogs is actually the same dog is given to us by the continuity of our natural physical world. and video captures this continuity and gives us this this extra uh, uh, signal to to teach us about that and this signal seems to be extremely important there I, uh, there's some wonderful experimental work by wood uh, who who has this vr set up for chicks so he has a whole bunch of little vr caves and he 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 ha puts chicks there i think they are born in those vr caves and he allow he basically shows them he controls their visual input he he projects uh, a visual input on into these vr caves and so all that the chicks have seen since they're born is what they sh he shows it to them and so what he was showing is that if the chicks are exposed to video that's not visually continu continuous like this this thing for example here they don't w develop visual system as good as if they were shown visually continuously. So their, their visual abilities are impaired if they don't get this crucial continuity cue, okay? And so we think that this is an extremely important signal for learning. Uh, third, many would argue that video also gives you order. There is this wonderful saying, time is what keeps everything from happening at once. And and you know, video basically gives us this 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 ordering, so we can say this happens first, this second, second, the second, third, etc. Now, I would argue that I don't think you actually need video for that. So here is an example of instructions for how to fold a paper airplane. And you know, this is there is no video; it's just a bunch of stills, but it basically captures all of the steps and all of the ordering in the stills. So while I do think that ordering is very important, uh, I believe that you don't actually need a video for it. It's fine to, you don't, the continuity is not really important, okay? So we're not gonna worry about this one for now. Okay, so let's talk about video from the old days with my old man's game. 
Um, in the very beginning, it was really, there, there was a beautiful story, okay? The beautiful story was called spatial temporal XYT volumes, right? So you have, you, you basically say, well, the image is two dimensional and the video is basically just a 3D cube with the third dimension being time, right? And so the beautiful, very nice, clean story. And you can see like from the different sides of this cubes, you can also see things and you can, you know, you can track your cars in a, in a, on the freeway and stuff like this. And there's some delightful work from Ted Adelson, for example, who noticed that if you look at people walking and you look at their leg, if you slice it on their legs, that you get these braided patterns that you can use to, to detect, you know, their, 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 where they're going and, and their speed. Uh, uh, there is a wonderful paper that was very influenced, I was very influenced in by, uh, by Lihi and, and Michal, uh, which basically said, okay, let's just take a, uh, spatial temporal gradients in this XYT volume and just look at their histograms and use that to do action action recognition. And it worked surprisingly well. I mean, it just, I, in fact, I believe that all of action recognition right now is basically not doing anything more than than just this kind of a spatial temporal texture. And indeed, kind of a, this, this idea is kind of coming back again with these uh, 3D convolutions that are basically very much in that spirit, okay? Um, uh, Segmentation also was very interested in these kind of uh, uh, looking at the segment grouping in the spatial temporal volume, uh, the work of, of normalized cuts by, by she and Malik basically sets up a, this big affinity graph between pixels in all of the, all of the frames in, in the volume. And then you basically do a spectral graph partitioning and you can separate, separate groups of these, these, these volumes in, 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 in space time. Um, one paper that I want to mention that I just, I love it so much. And I noticed that the young kids, I'm sure the older people would know about it, but the younger kids, at least in Berkeley, haven't heard about this. And I think this is a shame because this is, I think, one of the most influential uh, uh, paper of, of, of the, of the you know, last couple of 20 years. It was published in, in SIGGRAPH 2000, okay? Um, so I just show you a little bit about what it is. So it's it basically the this problem statement that you start with a video clip and you create a video texture. You basically make it infinite, okay? And the motivation comes all the way from Claude Shannon uh, who proposed a way to do text, text synthesis by using n-grams. And the idea is you basically just, you assume that English is, is, is uh, uh, you know, you assume a Markov chain model of English and then you basically uh, compute distributions of n-grams, and then you sample from that Markov chain and you create new uh, new, uh, new letters or even new words. So for example, here you say, you know, if you have a, like a bigram, you say need to, you know, what's, what's likely, need to eat. And you shift it by one, say like, need to eat what? To eat, you know, or, or need to eat, need to sleep, et cetera, no, to eat what? And then, you know, to eat whatever, cake, okay, right? Uh, and then you just, and this is basically what your, 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 you know, your SMS texting, this is, this is all Shannon stuff that you're doing when you, when you're texting on SMS, right? And what I got inspired by this, and we did kind of this, this, this idea of this Markov chain on pixels, and this was our texture synthesis paper. And, uh, and uh, video textures folks looked at the same idea and say, you know, we can do even simpler. We can just do Markov chain on frame. And this is basically the idea of the paper. Let's set up a Markov chain where we just jump around in between frames. It's kind of mark. It's a random walk in 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 on, on frames. Okay. And so all they did is they, they created an affinity matrix between all frames to all frames with something like L2 distance, basically something very simple again, stationary camera. Um, and then they basically use that to find good transitions. Okay. And so the only trick here is basically let's say that you have a video and then you know that from you know, you can go direct, you can follow along in the video, you know, from I to I plus one, or you can jump from I to J. And the idea is that you, if you jump to a frame J that looks very similar to what you would have jumped to in a I plus one, then it would be a good transition, okay? And that's basically what they use. And if you do it just that, then you don't get, the dynamics are not preserved. So then you basically temporarily smooth it over a few frames, and then and then do the same trick and then just works. Okay, it's a beautifully simple paper that works very very well. Okay, and one thing that I really liked about it is that, that you can add 
you can add more constraints to it. You can kind of can, you make it conditional by by having some labels. For example, you you have some you know how you know you compute how fast or smooth, slow this person is moving, and then by sampling from the right frames, you can control user control how how you know the person is moving. Okay. And what they, the, the, my favorite thing they did is they, they, got a, they got a fish tank and they, got, they rented a fish for a day. They detected you know, where the he, fish was headed. They did a blue screen. And then they basically just added this control term. And then you have a fish being controlled by a mouse, okay? And this is, again, this is 2000, okay? And this is still way better than any of those, you know, uh, 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 GAN image synthesis videos that all of us are doing, right? This is this is really really impressive for how simple and how cool it is, and it's basically just resampling this uh, spatial temporal volume volume at the at the right frequency. Okay. Um, now, of course, nothing you know there was nothing was so great that you know the the X Y T volumes didn't really last, and the reason for that is that. The, it, there was definitely some issues, okay? First is that time is not just another dimension, okay? You, you can have uh, special temporal values assume that, you know, it's just another thing, but it's it's really not, right? Time is pencil, sampled much, much more coarsely than, than X and Y. And so really talking about spatial temporal gradients doesn't really make sense because, because they're not very good in time. Um, and also, these these volumes assume kind of this implicit correspondence that either you have a stationary camera so that the kind of a, a x y point in one frame is, is the same as in the next frame, or you have some maybe very simple uh, models. But in reality, you know, people walk around, the, the people move. It's like it, the things things are not stationary in this volume. Things move around, and and often they move around very quickly and, and in a complicated way is that you can just deal with it with pixels. And this is basically was why we kind of moved to kind of a more explicit notion of correspondence. And of course, the, the two ways of doing this is optical flow and object tracking. The optical flow, the nice thing is you get dense correspondences, you know, whole vector field, every pixel, you can know, you know where that pixel is gonna go in the next frame. The downside is that you, it's very short range. It's basically just two frames. You cannot really compose them together. They kind of they go go crazy very fast. So it's it's very short range and it's very local, right? You're just looking at the neighborhood around each, every pixel. Uh, object tracking, on the other hand, it's kind of a way to like turn turn your data into into a uh, uh, turn your data into a spatial temporal volume. Okay, and uh, and it's. Um, and and it's you know it it it's longer range, and it's kind of not so local. Um, it is, um, but it is one object at a time. Okay, so you can't really do the whole the whole image like that. And frankly, it's not very stable. Okay, so the video I was showing is like you know maybe 45, 45 frames or or something because you know it it crashed in the forty six frame. In fact, if you you look at all these old tracking papers in the in the in the 90s and 2000s their metric that they compete on is time to failure like how many frames until your tracking stops which is maybe not what you really want uh your 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 um, your your computer vision program to be so this is where um kind of a big change happened i remember it happening i was right there i was in oxford with deva when when this paper came out the idea was you know tracking is hard but detection seems to be much easier so why don't we just do detect the tracking by repeated detection okay and so this is finally when learning you know shows up into the into the story right so the idea here was that you just take you know pick a good frame train a very simple detector just on that frame. So it's kind of like test time tracking before it's time and best test time training. And then you just use that train model on all the other frames, okay? And it just worked so much better and it wouldn't crash and it would recover and just all the nice things. And, and then basically this, this kind of took over and now uh, 
you know, now people just use a fancy off the shelf detectors and, and just do it repeatedly and maybe do some temporal smoothing at, at, at the end, but, but not that much, okay? Um, but you lose kind of the explicit correspondence. So the correspondence is only on the level of detectors now. Um, and, you know, people also kind of build on top of this, so the whole, whole field of data association is basically, uh, uh, you know, you start with detecting objects in, you know, independently in each frame, which requires supervision, and then you connect all these detections together, maybe in a global way using a graph or something, and there is a whole bunch of really cool work doing that, but it's kind of divorced from the pixels. Now you're basically doing it on, on these detections that, that are now nodes in this graph, okay? And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to kind of get rid of the supervision and also kind of try to do this from the pixel, okay? And we, uh, being, you know, a lab that, that is excited about cell supervision, we are really wanted to kind of use time as our superv supervisory signal. And there has been a number of, of cool papers in this area. Of course, the obvious way to use time is to just, you know, predict the pixels of future frames and use that to, you know, to learn features. That unfortunately doesn't work very well, right? It's, it's a very hard task. Other tasks are actually easier, something like predicting the error of time or predicting the mismatch, the misalignment between audio and video, or a paper that was really very influential for us is predicting color over time and use that to kind of to, 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 to learn good features. Um, so what people have done before was they would say, okay, you know, let's 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 think about way of learning similarity from video by just you know using an off-the-shelf tracker, tracking uh, some patches, and then just giving different instances of this patch over time to our similarity <coughs> learning metric, and then you know learn data from that. But of course, that's limited by how good your tracker or your optical flow is, right? If that screws up, then you're you're screwed. Um, so we have this kind of a chicken and egg problem. You know, similarity requires tracking, but tracker kind of needs similarity. And so what we thought last year was let's do it together. Let's do it jointly. Um, and so this was a paper we had at last CUPR uh, with uh, Shalong Wang and, and Alan. Um, and basically the idea is very, very simple. We're going to basically have a deep tracker and we're going to learn the feature representation of that deep tracker by making it track things. But of course, well, if we just track things, we don't have a supervision. So what we, what we did was we're going to track things backwards, and then we're going to track or track forwards and then track backwards again, so that then we end up in the same frame. And now we, in the, if if everything is right, that we should end up where we start, right? The cycle consistency constraint or the forward backward constraint in in old style tracking work. But of course, we are not going to be at the same place because the tracking initially is bad, but then the delta that we have can be used as supervisory signal that we can back propagate through our tracker, through the feature and get the feature to be better, okay? And so here is an example of its a training time. So this is kind of, you start with something like this and then as, the, as we optimize the, the, the consistency error, the, the feature gets better, so the tracking gets better, then it gets more and more cycle custom, okay? So that was, we were very excited about this paper, but it definitely had some limitations. So, you know, one thing is that it's one patch at a time, right? So you're, you're, you really kind of focus on one patch and you learn from this just one patch. Second, this whole, the tracking is kind of winner takes all. So, you know, there is like a hard tracking and there is, it's not able to consider different hypotheses. It's like only one thing, and if that's wrong, then basically you're screwed, okay? So it's kind of hard to optimize. Uh, and the tracker itself was kind of complex. There was a spatial transformer in there, so they just made things very, very hairy. Um, and as a result, you know, it, it didn't seem like it would improve for longer cycles. We hope that we could get really long cycles to learn something really complicated, but after about six frames, the, those, the cycles didn't really help us that much. Um, and also what was really sad for me as a data-driven guy, um, 
adding more data didn't actually improve things. In fact, sometimes it would make things worse. And, and also just training for longer didn't improve things. So this was just kind of a, that, that wasn't right, right? Like more data should make things better, especially in this, uh, if you're self-supervised, you don't need any training, any, any labels. You just need to, you know, you train it uh, for, for like the whole universe. And so this year we have a brand new work that we try to fix a lot of these issues. And also I think the new work is just much simpler and just much more nice. So, so I'm very happy about it. And now we are going to switch to Alan, who is actually going to tell you about it. Hello. Hi, so I'm Alan. Um, I'll be presenting our work titled Spacetime Correspondence is a Contrastive Random Walk. Uh, and uh, this is joint work with Andrew Owens uh, and my advisor, Alyosha, and we will be putting it on our on archive very soon. Uh, it's a submission to, uh, to a conference that, that happened very recently. Um, so as Alyosha motivated in this work, our aim is to learn a similarity representation for correspondence from unlabeled video. And so we want to do this without any sort of annotations. Uh, moreover, a focus on this work will be uh, simplicity and scalability. So as Alyosha pointed out, there are a number of issues with the kinds of uh, prior works that have explored this idea of bootstrapping and initially random representation, because a lot of these involve complex tracking procedures and these, track these trackers tend to be greedy and deterministic. So uh, in this work, our, our aim is really to simplify everything so that it's much more scalable. Uh, so while we eventually want to learn this without any sort of supervision, let's first suppose that we did have supervision. Just take a step back and think about what we could do in that case. So if we do have supervision, for instance, if we are told that these two patches are in correspondence, of course we can learn our representation by just doing uh, supervised similarity learning. We can do metric learning, contrastive learning, whatever you want to call it. We know that we have two positives here. So uh, the positives for the similarity learning will be the blue patch and the green patch, and uh, all their pairs will be negatives. Uh, more interestingly, we can actually use this supervision uh, to provide supervision for inter intermediate time frames. So if there's a time frame that exists between these two time frames, well, then we can do something like predict the similarity between the blue patch and the green patch by going through the intermediate time frame. Right? And by what I mean by going through the intermediate time frame is predicting the similarity uh, of the blue patch with the green patch as a function of the patches uh, in between them. And in particular, if we consider a bunch of patches in the intermediate time frame, we actually get a distribution of related correspondences. And this is really nice because this actually allows us to consider, as Eliosha was, was, was implying, uh, multiply hypotheses. Um, multiple paths through the graph. And this is really important because it actually allows the model to explore what correspondences should actually be, uh, be formed, to consider associations which might initially seem uh, not very obvious, but eventually totally would make sense. Now, of course, the challenge is that we still were relying on supervision. Uh, but if we're smart about how we choose the training sequences that we see at training time, uh, we can actually get away with not even needing supervision. So for example, we can consider sequences that are palindromes. And a palindrome is just a sequence that is identical when it's reversed. And uh, so here we can just turn our video into a palindrome by simply concatenating the reverse version of the video with itself. And now we can note that the first and the last frame are of course identical. And so now by construction, we actually have a ground truth correspondence. So now we know that the blue patch and the green patch actually are in correspondence. And now we actually have supervision to form a bunch of latent correspondences along, along uh, the, the path that is formed uh, between, uh, between our first and our last frame on this graph. So uh, this is a high level motivation. And in this work, we develop a simple probabilistic formulation that essentially casts correspondence as a random walk on a space-time graph. So in this graph, the nodes will be patches that we extract from each time frame, and only the nodes that are in adjacent time steps will share an edge. And so this edge will be a directed edge because it will go in the direction of time. And in particular, the strength of the edge will be determined by a learned similarity function. So it'll be a learned contrastive similarity function. And we're going to learn this similarity function such that 
a random walk that begins at the query node here, which is shown in blue, will follow a path of correspondence as it steps through the graph to eventually reach a target node. So here I'm showing a bunch of sampled random walks. And uh, by casting correspondence in a random walk in this way, we can basically efficiently express um, the, uh, uh, we can e efficiently express long range correspondence by simply performing a matrix multiplication of transition matrices in time. And we can consider the whole distribution over paths through the graph. Um, and this has nice properties because it essentially allows us to consider uh, ambiguous cases and learn associations that maybe um, weren't initially obvious. So more concretely, uh, given some uh, frame IT, we extract a set of nodes QT. And in practice, we can do this by simply extracting, uh, sampling rather, uh, patches from, from the image. Uh, and we can do this by simply uh, sampling patches uh, on a grid. Uh, so given uh, a set of nodes QT that is adjacent in time to a set of nodes QT plus one, we can just compute the transition matrix by uh, computing the similarity matrix between all nodes. So we compute all pairwise node similarities for these two time steps. And then we just normalize each of the rows of this similarity matrix with a softmax function. Uh, and of course, the, the pairwise similarities will be parameterized by a learned embedding phi, and phi is exactly what we'll be learning in this work. So if xt is the position of the walker at time t, then of course this transition matrix by definition just defines the conditional distribution of where the walker is at time t plus one, given where it is in time t. So given the spatiotemporal connectivity in this graph, we can view the random walk as essentially performing probabilistic patch tracking. Um, and moreover, we can perform long range correspondence, we can compute rather, we can compute long range correspondence by simply multiplying these transition matrices that we get. And so here, a bar will denote the uh, k-step transition matrix through this graph. And so under this formulation, learning our representation, learning our embedding phi, essentially amounts to fitting these transition probabilities. So the question, of course, is how will we fit these transition probabilities? Um, and uh, again, let's first suppose that we did have ground truth supervision. So we can first consider one step of this random walk. So here I'm showing one step of a random walk. We're in time t, and we'd like to transition to time t plus one. The node that we're currently at, we'll call the query nodes, shown here in blue. And the most natural thing to do if, if we have ground truth correspondence is simply to maximize the probability that we transition to the target node, given that we're the query node. Of course, we obtain this probability by contrasting the similarity between the, the query node and uh, all of the neighbors that it has, including the, uh, the target, which we'll here call the positive, and a bunch of other negatives, which are all the other patches in the image. So we can see that by maximizing the probability of this transition, we're actually maximizing the contrastive similarity between the representation of the query patch and the representation of the, the positive patch. So maximizing the probability of the transition is basically a contrastive learning problem where the outcome, as in the learning signal of doing this, is essentially pushing the query representation towards the representation of the, the positive patch and away from the representation of the negatives. And so here I show just a, a diagram of the L2 normalized embedding that we're learning. And so the embeddings will lie on the hypersphere and we're essentially shifting the embedding towards the positive. Um, more interestingly, we can actually consider what happens when we chain these correspondences in time. So when you chain these correspondences in time, of course, we do so by computing the k-step transition matrix. Recall that we do this by simply taking the product of these, of these transition matrices. And this gives us the, the distribution over nodes k-step in the future, given that I begin in some position in the current time step. And by computing uh, this, this product of transition matrices, we're actually summing out all the intermediate time steps. So in principle, when we're actually maximizing the probability of reaching the target here, which we, in principle, uh, sorry, in practice, we do this by minimizing cross-entropy loss. The cross-entropy loss is between the target uh, distribution, which here is y, and the uh, predicted transition distribution, which is the k-step transition distribution. By maximizing this probability, we're actually aiming to shift weight to paths that are actually linking the query and the target nodes. But at the same time, we're actually jointly optimizing over all of the query and target nodes in this graph. So all of the query target nodes in the first time step. 
um, which basically means that these query and target pairs will be competing for, for paths through the graph. So in an easy case where con correspondence is maybe obvious, uh, maybe the transition distribution is actually very low entropy. So the probability of reaching the target is pretty high. There's not much to learn here. And in fact, the learning signal will be almost zero because the probability of reaching the target is already very high. But in more ambiguous cases, uh, so for instance, cases that involve deformations, uh, occlusions, partial occlusions rather, um, uh, multimodality because an object splits in half, et cetera, because we're considering a distribution over paths, the model can actually hedge mass over more than one path. And this is helpful because it actually allows it to overcome these ambiguities. And overcoming these ambiguities is really important if we actually want to learn from long range correspondence. You can imagine that in the case of just doing greedy tracking with, uh, with a, a box tracker, the moment you actually lose the track, you're kind of, uh, you're kind of uh, in, a, in a bad situation. In this case, we're always actually going to be considering um, the distribution over paths, which is, which is much, ni much nicer in terms of being able to learn uh, associations which initially are not obvious, but, but eventually uh, might actually be fitting. Um, so the job of the encoder is basically to learn similarity between nodes such that it can hedge mass over paths if necessary, but such that it also does not link nodes that would end up making the walker go astray during its walk. So this formulation is nice because it allows us to consider multiple paths to the graph in a really simple way. It allows us to consider long range correspondence in a pretty simple way. And by simply providing the target at the end of the path, we're actually providing implicit supervision for all the contrastive learning problems that appear along that path. And so this is great, but of course the issue is, is that we still need supervision because we're relying on ground truth correspondence. Um, of course, as we alluded to, we can turn the supervised problem into a self-supervised problem by just choosing the right training sequences. So for, for example, if we take palindrome sequences uh, we essentially just can treat the initial query node as the target node itself. Um, and this means that we can basically optimize uh, this representation on raw video without requiring any sort of supervision. And this is essentially a cycle consistency loss because we're basically saying that first taking the random walk in one direction on the graph and a random walk in the other direction on the graph should essentially give us the identity uh, where the identity is simply the delta distribution for the, the index of each node. Uh, just to provide some uh, concrete implementation details, uh, we train with frames uh, of size 256 by 256. Um, and in practice, we just extract nodes in a pretty simple way. We extract nodes that are size, uh, that are patches, size 64 by 64. And I should note that we actually didn't, um, we didn't tune this procedure. We actually borrowed, borrowed it directly from contrastive predictive coding, CPC. So in that paper, uh, they essentially extract nodes of size 64 by 64 uh, with stride 32. And this ends up giving you a seven by seven grid of patches. Um, and so once we have these patches, we just embed them with a ResNet. Uh, and the ResNet then maps uh, to an embedding, which is L2 normalized. So it lives on the hypersphere. Um, so even though the story might not have seemed that linear or simple until now, uh, this algorithm is actually very simple in practice. And we can actually implement it in very few lines. So the first few lines here basically show how to unfold the video into a set of patches. Then we apply spatial jittering on the patches so that they don't share boundary effects, so that they don't share boundaries. Um, and then we just embed these, these patches into node representations. Uh, then we construct the graph by just uh, performing a bunch of matrix multiplications to obtain the transition matrices. And then we can walk on the graph by just chaining matrix multipl multiplication in time. So this is really the entire algorithm. Uh, we don't really require any sort of region localization uh, modules, which are often used in, uh, in this area. We're simply uh, just extracting uh, a huge graph of representations, and we're just doing random walks on this graph. So a few more training details. Uh, we train on the unlabeled kinetics data set. Uh, we use an atom optimizer with learning rate 0 0.0001. Uh, in practice, we perform 1 million weight updates. Um, uh, and we actually trained most of the, the later models with three GPUs per model, which uh, gave us basically 24 sequences per batch. Uh, we also could train the model with just one GPU, which gives us eight sequences per batch. And we had to do this out of necessity early on just to do experiments in parallel 
uh, for computational um, limitation uh, for compute limitation reasons. Um, but so these are the training details and uh, Despite the simplicity of, of this, this approach, we actually find that it outperforms the self-supervised state of the art on a number of label propagation tasks. So to apply the model, we basically use the learned representation phi for label propagation, and we evaluate it on a semantic part propagation task, which is done with the VIP benchmark. We evaluate it on a post propagation task, uh, which is the JHMDB benchmark. And then finally, we evaluate it on object propagation uh, with the Davis benchmark. So first I'll just show some qualitative results and then we'll dive into some quantitative results. Oh, but first I'll explain uh, label propagation. So under our model, we, wa we actually want to, um, we want to use the simplest algorithm possible for label propagation so that we can really understand how good our representation is. So to do this, we're simply going to take a weighted average of the K nearest neighbors given some node. So given, uh, let's say T plus one, which is our unlabeled frame, for some position in this frame, we're basically going to compute the transition matrix from that position to all the other positions in some labeled frame in time t. And now, instead of taking all of uh, a weighted sum of all of these labels, we're just going to threshold this transition matrix to get only the k nearest neighbors. And then we'll simply take a weighted sum of these label distributions to obtain the label distribution in time t plus 1 for this position. So we're essentially performing k nearest neighbors to obtain a weighted sum of the label distributions of our k nearest neighbors. Um, and this follows common practice, uh, which allows us to perform pair comparisons. Uh, one additional trick that people use in practice, and so we therefore use for fair comparison, is people tend to use more context. So in addition to using the first frame, uh, it's, it's common to also use the last M frames. And of course, the labels that are predicted for the last M frames are actually predictions. And so this basically amounts to an autoregressive label propagation algorithm. Uh, and this is commonly done in prior work. So here I'll just show some, ex uh, some examples of semantic part propagation. I should note that compared to the other data sets we'll consider, the frame rate of this data set is much lower and uh, there are many more parts. And so because of that, the video tends to look choppier because of the frame rate being lower. Uh, that also makes the task harder because we have less, we have less temporal continuity. And so we can see that this is a rather long video, but we're still able to track uh, the objects reasonably well. So here we have a video with a lot of motion. Um, and again, of course, we don't always keep all of the parts, but we were able to track the regions relatively well. Uh, here, uh, we'll see some pose tracking results. I'll be comparing to a method called UVC, uh, which is a relatively state-of-the-art method it was presented at NeurIPS last year. I'm using this method because their code is available online. It's the best performing model with available code. Um, and their, uh, their videos will be in gray because it's a method that's based on colorization. So this is pose tracking on the JHMDB uh, benchmark. And we can see that compared to that, this method, we're able to, to track uh, the hand and the arms uh, much better. In this case, we also see that we're able to track the, the arms better. Um, because we're not actually modeling the dynamics between the parts and the consistency and how the parts are moving, we're just comparing visual features. Uh, sometimes the skeletons we get are actually <laughs> very unnatural, uh, but this is not very surprising. So in this case, we also are able to follow the arms better as they move up and then through the swing. Uh, and towards the end, both method methods lose the tracks because the tracks go off screen. Uh, here's another example. Here we do better until the very end. Um, and then finally, I'll show some results for the, the video object propagation task on the Davis benchmark. And this is a very popular benchmark used for uh, video object segmentation. Again, we'll be comparing to the UBC method of Lee et al. Uh, so here in this example, we have an occlusion. Um, and we can see that uh, compared to their method, which suffers from a lot of bleeding when this occlusion happens, we're actually able to preserve boundaries much better and we can overcome this occlusion much better. And this is simply because our representation is just more sharp. It, it, it is a better similarity metric for comparing uh, these, these pixel features. Uh, here's another example where we're able to respect boundaries better. Okay. 
here's an example where we see the objects uh, change in scale drastically um, and also rotate. Um, and again, in this, in this example, we can see that we're able to preserve object boundaries much better. Um, and we're also able to track much more of the object much further through the video. So here, for instance, we can see that we, we keep uh, the first person almost entirely, the cart almost entirely, though we do lose some of the second person. And here's just a still frame comparison, which shows uh, how we actually get, we do better on the boundary. So you can see that in the second half of the cart, we respect the boundaries of the, of the person much better, and we actually respect the boundaries of the cart much better. Here's one last example that, that shows a lot, of, uh, a lot of motion. And so again, we can see that we respect boundaries better. Um, we also considered uh, an interesting extension of our method inspired by the idea of common fate. So common fate is the idea that, uh, that pixels or points in, in an image that move together should be grouped together. And this is uh, an old uh, Gestaltus idea from Wertheimer. And uh, so this inspires a really trivial extension of our method, which essentially amounts to just randomly dropping out edges in our graph. And so we can implement this by simply applying dropout on the transition matrices that we compute. And what this does is, is effectively um, forces the model to not only model the ideal path, but also hedge mass onto paths that are highly correlated with the ideal path. And so this essentially will in, uh, encourage the model to learn associations between segments that might be highly correlated. Uh, and so before we show the other quantitative results, here we can see the effect of this edge dropout. Uh, we actually find that a moderate amount of this edge dropout actually does improve performance on the Davis task. Um, of course, adding too much dropout um, ends up actually hurting performance. And this is because uh, this excludes the ideal path too often, which then forces the model to basically blur the representation and make everything more similar to everything else more than it should. So we can consider quantitative comparisons to this, uh, the self-supervised state of the art on the uh, Davis benchmark. Um, so here we can first compare against time cycle and we see a significant increase in performance. Oh, first I should first note, um, the metrics for the Davis task are uh, the average of two metrics, J being the Jacquard index, uh, as in the, the, the overlap, uh, or rather the intersection over union of the regions, so the ground truth mask and the predicted mask. And F is basically a measure that shows, uh, sorry, a metric that measures the alignment on the boundary. So we can see right off the bat that we perform significantly better than uh, prior work time cycle, which has conceptually a related idea, but is executed in a very different way. Moreover, we can compare to other methods that are based on colorization. So UVC is a method I've already mentioned. In practice, what they do is they use colorization combined with um, cycle consistency and also combined with a grouping loss. Um, and they also rely on a localization module to actually do tracking at training time and at test time. Uh, the other two methods shown in red, core flow and mast, are also colorization techniques. The main difference being that um, they actually rely on feature resolution, uh, a feature map that's 2x the resolution. So this is quite an advantage. Um, compared to these methods, we're still, we're, we're still able to outperform them even though we're actually using a, a much smaller resolution uh, feature map. And even though these other methods uh, tend to involve localization modules. So for instance, mask is the current state of the art uh, before our method on the Davis task and they rely on uh, memory augmentation. So using the memory bank at training time as well as um, using a localization, a region localization module at training and at test time. Uh, we also compare against uh, some strong image representation baselines. So an image representation pre-trained on ImageNet, or an image representation trained with MoCo, which is a state-of-the-art self-supervised method, and um, uh, the Vince method. So Vince here is basically MoCo, but applied on the kinetics data set. So in addition to getting uh, uh, positives that are crops from the same image, you would also consider crops from adjacent images in the video. Uh, we find that compared to these methods, uh, we still outperform them significantly, even though these are very strong baselines. And uh, we interpret this as basically the effect of choosing the right views when you're doing contrastive learning. So because we have a dense association task, it helps to actually choose views in a way that isn't completely random. So whereas MoCo and Vince, these techniques tend to just randomly crop patches. In our case, we're actually inferring which of the patches should correspond. Uh, we can also see that our method outperforms the state of the art on uh, the self-supervised state of the art on the semantic part prop propagation task. 
and when we give our method uh, a bit more context, so instead of giving it one frame of context, instead giving it five frames of context, we can actually outperform the supervised method that was proposed by this benchmark's authors. And then we can also see that we get uh, increased performance uh, on the post-propagation task. And we actually found, uh, and this is especially compared to the self-supervised state of the art, and we found this surprising because UVC is a method that actually does fine-grained matching at training time. UVC is basically a colorization task. And uh, with cycle consistency and with grouping losses included, um, whereas we're just doing patch tracking. So despite the fact that we're not doing a fine-grained pixel level um, matching task, we still outperform these methods. Uh, and we think that the reason is because we have a lot of really strong negatives by considering negatives from the same image. Um, moreover, one last experiment we can do is we can consider uh, how to actually adapt this learned representation with self-supervision. So, so far the story has been that we take a pre-trained representation and then we just directly test it on some example, X, which means that we're not doing any sort of adaptation. We could also consider um, how we can use the self-supervised objective that we've actually come up with to fine tune on this example X before actually testing on it. And I, I should emphasize here that we're not using any sort of labels. We're simply using the data, the actual pixels themselves. And we're essentially applying algorithm one, which is the algorithm I showed earlier, just simply to one example. And what we find is actually, so, so these are the different metrics that are measured in the Davis task. And what we find is we find uh, consistent performance by simply taking around 200 uh, SGD steps at test time. So this is averaged over all the examples in the validation set of Davis. And we see the strongest increase in performance in the J recall metric, which is basically the Jacquard index metric, uh, the recall of the Jacquard index metric, which is measured as the proportion of frames in which more than 50% of the object is, is tracked. So this adaptation actually allows us to adapt to some of the statistics of the test time example, even though we're not using supervision. Uh, we can also study the effect of the path length of training. And so encouragingly, um, we actually find that as we use longer and longer path lengths uh, during training, we actually see improved performance on the Davis task. So this actually shows that we can actually benefit, we can profit from long range correspondences. And, uh, and so to conclude, um, we propose a simple and effective formulation for learning correspondence in a scalable way from unlabeled video. Uh, we showed how we can implicitly provide supervision for contra contrastive learning problems that actually involve latent positives. And we did, we did, in this work, we did this by imposing a path level constraint. Um, even though our method is, is pretty simple and it can be implemented in a really simple way, and does not really involve too much domain-specific machinery, uh, we find that it outperforms the self-supervised state-of-the-art on a number of label propagation tasks. Um, and we also find that test time adaptation with a self-supervised loss can lead to even better performance. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Alyosha and Alan, for a great talk. Um, we have a few questions in the chat, so I'm going to go through by order. Uh, first question from Victoria Escoria. Um, question to Alan. Don't you need to weight the nodes as people used to do in optical flow where pixels without texture are ignored? Um, the question is for patches without texture, maybe they should have low weights and, and so on. So, Right. So in practice, we actually didn't weight nodes at all. Um, I think maybe like one thing you're kind of getting at is uh, in, in one case, uh, so one bad case for instance would be where you have a bunch of patches of the sky. Uh, and in this case, basically you might get a, kind of an irreducible error because you'll never actually be able to put um, all of your mass in the right target, right? Because basically you'll have uniform uh, distribution over all the patches that look identical because they're all patches from the sky. You can actually show though that the loss, the gradient of that loss sorry, the gradient of the objective in that kind of setting will just essentially be zero. So in cases where you have irreducible error, basically all of those errors will cancel out and those, are, those, those examples don't really matter. So that's maybe one example where you'd think maybe you should weight these nodes because you know, they're really textureless, they're really hard to tell apart from each other. But in practice, this actually isn't really a problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from Victoria was to Alyosha. Can you share your take about the work of civic Sisterman and collaborators using self-supervision self -super, self with language, the MIL-NC paper? 
uh, shall we stay away from language? <laughs> um, uh, look, I, you know, Joseph and AZ are my dear friends. And of course, everything they do is going to be a fantastic and amazing. Um, I am, I guess I'm just not brave enough to do language myself just because, um, it's 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 hard it's 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 you know we are so far from getting even to the level of you know a rodent or something right i i i'm i think it's just it's yeah it's brave to do language and i'm maybe just not brave enough although i think the kind of the way where you use language is like as a feature rather than as a as like the main thing i think those are like you know we we use gps we use, uh, uh, you know, we use the time of day. We, we, you know, we can also use the fact that, you know, this thing is called X in English and Y in French and Z in Russian. And, you know, as long as we don't treat it as God-given ground truth, but like another noisy signal, I think that's fine. Thank you. Uh, another question is from Madi Halaye. Um, this question to Alan. Isn't the patch to patch similarity, the frame between T and T plus one computationally expensive because it would be like O of n to the fourth power? Um, yeah, so actually, I guess in practice, um, I guess here you're calling n basically the dimension of the image. Uh, you can recall that actually we're actually extracting not that many patches from each image. So as I mentioned, we're just following the procedure that was done in CPC. In CPC, they extract basically a seven by seven grid of patches. So really in this case, N is just seven. Um, so that's actually not that large. Um, but you're right, in the case of basically actually computing the transition matrix between two time steps, if N is the dimension of the spatial map of patches, then it is N to the fourth. But we can actually get away with basically subsampling the image, only extracting a relatively small set of patches, and that's actually not that computationally expensive at all. Okay, thank you. The okay, next question is from Dima Damen, Damon. Um, thanks for the great presentation. I'm intrigued by your choice of downstream task. If this was tracking method, i.e. it is learning spatial temporal representations, then testing on DOT, for example, would be more natural. However, I believe your method is in, in fact modeling the relative positions of patches, i.e. it is a pose-based self-learner, making it suitable for the task of Davis and pose. Did you test it for traditional tracking? Do you agree that it is learning pose? Um, yeah, so um, I agree that it would it'd be great to test it on VOT uh, and now that the, the deadline is over and we have some time, we want to both test it on VOT and we also want to test it on the YouTube video object uh, segmentation data set, which is a harder video object segmentation data set. In terms of your question about tracking, um, there's many methods that actually do tracking based on just correlation filters. And so um, what we really have is basically a really good representation for measuring cor correlation. So in that sense, um, I actually think that uh, this representation that we learned with this method would do really well when plugged into basically a correlation filter. Uh, and this is something that would definitely be a good experiment to, to do. Um, I'm not sure I understand what you mean that it is learning pose. If by pose you mean the relative positions of patches, um, not quite because remember that we're actually measuring, we're actually, uh, the transitions are between time steps. They're not in space. Well, they're technically in space and time, but uh, really the, the closest patch to you would just be the same entity slightly transformed in the future. And so we're not really actually learning relative positions of patches in space, we're learning relative positions of patches in time, uh, which is basically tracking. Uh, once we actually add the dropout trick though that we had, we're actually just randomly dropping out edges in the graph, then you could maybe make the argument that we are actually learning both relative position between patches in time and in space. Because in those cases, we actually will be incentivized to not only model relative uh, similarities in time, but also in space. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, another question from Ya Peng Tian. Uh, really smart work. Uh, one question is whether the learn 2D features can be 3D features learned by self-supervised models on active action recognition or 
or since this model can only learn 2D features now? Yeah, that's a great, a great question. Um, we haven't actually evaluated these features on kind of semantic classification tasks. I imagine that doing it for action recognition wouldn't necessarily maybe be too bad because we are modeling basically, um, we have basically a dense representation. Um, I should mention though that you can, it's really, really simple to just lift this, this method into learning a 3D representation. You basically just have to use a 3D component instead of a 2D component. And then you can still construct a graph in the same way. And so this is totally future work that we'd like to do if we had much more compute. Um, you could basically use the same method almost identically, but you just change the 2D ResNet with the 3D ResNet. And then basically your patches aren't space patches and uh, spatial patches anymore, image patches, they're space time patches. Um, and we actually think that this is an interesting direction because it's not clear how to actually do contrastive learning on video. Um, so far, contrastive learning has been successful with images um, because it turns out that we can just get away with randomly cropping, uh, ran randomly cropping patches from an image and saying that they should go together. But there's a lot of reasons why this does work. So first of all, these hyperparameters for these data augmentation things have been overfit on ImageNet. We also know that ImageNet is an, an, a, an ob a centered object data set. So taking random crops of an, a centered object, an expectation you'll get part of the object. So that's not too problematic. But once you start to actually try to apply these data augmentation strategies, randomly sampling crops from a video, things get much more complicated. And it's not clear to me if you can just throw a compute at the problem and just say, okay, the, the learning signal is going to be much more noisy in video because you have time, which is very different from space. So you don't necessarily know how to choose positives and negatives. I don't know if compute will just solve that problem. Maybe we can just scale it on way more compute. Or maybe we need to be smarter about how we actually uh, figure out what views should be in correspondence. So our method is basically a way of growing similarity from a track. So you can imagine that we, we obtain a track and then we can grow outwards from that track. Whereas in traditional contrastive learning, the idea is basically that you're going to take a cube of this data and you're going to chisel away what is actually, uh, what actually is similar and what isn't similar by considering all the possible pairs in this data. Okay, I, I want to just add a little bit, pour, pour a little bit of a cold water on the whole action recognition story. I'm actually not sure we should be evaluating on action recognition data sets, because as I said before, I think all that the current action recognition data sets are capturing is basically spatial temporal texture. And I think it's not surprising that you don't really need to have that much 3D information to do well on it, or, or really any information to do well on it. So I'm, I think that it, we, we have a bigger problem here that we actually don't know how to evaluate action recognition. We don't even have a definition of what action recognition is. So, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, I think we need to be very cautious and, and make sure that we are actually measuring what we think we are measuring and not just, you know, spatial temporal texture. Okay, great. So it's almost out of time. So let's thank Alyosha and Alan again. Thanks for the great talk. Thank you. Thank you.